And we will move on to the next segment of this show. And of course, we will have the interesting and very inspiring story uh, from Eric. And hopefully you guys will enjoy the rest of the show. Thank you, Eric, for being here. You're such a wonderful person. It's just great to know you just for this few minutes that we've been together. It feels like we've known you for a long time. You've gone through a lot and and it seems like a lot of people like you use those moments to inspire other people that are going through the same thing. And I know a lot of our audience will probably love to hear your story. So can you give us a little bit of information about your story and what happened? Yes. Um, so uh, me being a, a hip hop artist, I've always liked hip hop. And so I was going to college for photography, doing hip hop, working two jobs. And we were celebrating our music project you know, our album release back in 97, September 20th and 97. Mm. So we have it at our house where all three of us, it's, our group was called miscellaneous. So I go outside to check the parking lot to make sure like people aren't in the neighbor's yards and stuff, everything's cool and stuff. Then I come back to the house, then maybe like five minutes after that, someone comes around the DJ van and then pulls the gun and boom, 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 boom. open fire. Well, instantly I got hit in the neck I still got the bullet in my third and fourth vertebrae. But instantly I fell down to the ground, laying flat on my back. Uh, I wasn't able to breathe at all. So I started like foaming at the mouth and then um, I wasn't able to speak or call out or cry or ask for help or anything. And I wasn't able to move either, but I could hear what was going on. You were, you were unconscious at that time, but you were able to hear what was going on. That's remarkable. Yeah, you're in and out of consciousness. I mean, uh-huh. you're you're laying there, your body's like numb, like like waves. You can hear the gum blast still. It's mm-hmm. a, it's like, uh, it's a hard experience to explain. But Very then, scary. Um, yeah, but I don't. I wouldn't say scary, because I don't think you have time to think about fear mm-hmm. or anything, any type of emotion. But uh oh, this could be over with. And then that's where I was like, not now, like not now. I got, you know, things to do. Like I got goals and dreams or I was so close to accomplishing something. I was like, this can't be it. This can't be not now, not the end. So I was like, whatever it's going to take, I'm just going to push through it. Like, I don't know what the situation is, but this is how it's got to be. So Eric, you, you said not now. I think that's really profound because when I heard that, it's almost like that's what is scaring you up to here, which is very inspiring. You say not now. Well, not now and that um, I know that I have more things that I got to take care of on this earth. Like I felt it. Like, no, I know there must be other things I'm supposed to be doing, but it's going to be challenging. Mm-hmm. And I was kind of negotiating of whatever spiritual mind the, the not speaking, but in your mind, you can hear the, the thoughts. And it was just like, it's going to be challenging, but us, whatever it is, you know, I'm down for the challenge. Mm-hmm. I'm down to keep going. Like, I want to live. I don't want to check out of the earth yet. Like, was there something that you were hanging on to at that last moment that you just said, I have to beat this, I have to survive? Well, I think, you know, like I said, I was 20 years old. And it seems like everything that I ever set out to achieve, I would almost accomplishment and then taken away. Even our music project, here it is, the big high moment of our life. Music project, album release, top of the world, bam, rock. <laughs> the whole life is rock. When I mean, you set out goals and you, you don't ever get to reach them, for one, you have barriers to see how bad you want the goal. You know, that's the challenge. When you have barriers, you're like, Nope, I want that goal. I really do. I want to obtain that goal. If you don't, then you're, you probably didn't want that goal. You know, when you have a little face of challenge and things like that. So it was that moment. It was just like, I'm 20. I got so much more to live for. That's so much more I can offer. Did I know at that time it was going to be like, oh, I'm going to be paralyzed from the neck down? Like, really? I, I mean, like, I couldn't breathe. I couldn't move. You're, li- you're living on, like, spirit, like, Whatever's within you, that spirit, that's all what's there. Like all the body in the shell is, hmm. I didn't do anything. Cause I, I wasn't able to use my voice, say help, wasn't able to get up 
and escape. I wasn't even able to hide. I was completely vulnerable and exposed. I don't even know where to start. You said something really important there when you said, um, whilst you were laying there, your spirit was talking to God. It was almost like you're trying to have a discussion with your God to try to give you a second chance so you can accomplish certain things in life. And I just want to know what have you gone through since then in terms of rehabilitation, in terms of treatment, just your journey in general from that time on? I would say definitely you are correct about that. You know, after I got shot and the, you end up in the hospital, they put four screws in my head to, mm -hmm. to put the halo on. So it's like metal halo that is tied all the way down to your waist. And by that time, you're just so numb. It doesn't matter what pain comes at you. I was on life support and a feeding tube that goes down with the tube. Then next thing you know, I'm waking up. And there's my mom, stepdad. Then doctors, they're telling you, you know, you're trying to move. They're like, they kind of give you the information. Like, you know, you're not, you're paralyzed from the neck down. Um, I communicated with eye blinks as I couldn't move my, like I blink once for yes, twice for no. And I, I think it was like a week later or two weeks later, that's where they decided that your paralysis has caused you not to be able to breathe on your own. So we're going to have to do a tracheotomy. And so that's when they cut you. Like, were you aware of what was going on around you? Oh, yeah, I was completely, once the next day, I was completely alert from the whole time. Even if they pumped me with a bunch of drugs out of in or whatever stuff they, they put in your IV to make you like <sighs> crash out. Because they'd say that you get anxiety, you know, just from stimulation and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, at the same time, people were trying to figure out who did the shooting? Why did the shooting happen? Uh, do we need to call a lawyer? Where's the detective? The main thing, the main goal right there was survival. Think about when you go somewhere and you hear like all kinds of conversations happening at one time. It's That's kind of what it's like. So everybody's just like, and then of course they kept saying, you know, look at Christopher Reeves, all the research that's happening. So now here comes the hope part. You know, well, you, you know, you might walk again or move your arms or, you know, Everybody's built on hope. Some people are built on truth, or some people are giving you the facts. Um, what was the next steps after the hospital? Did you have to go home and leave by yourself, or how did that work? No, so I was in the hospital from September 20th to October 29th. And basically, when you're at the hospital and some, you're, you're, have a trauma, like you know, what I had, catastrophic injury, the next step is rehab. So we had to find a, a rehab facility. Because I was on a ventilator, Inglewood, Colorado, it's called Craig Hospital heard about me and, you know, and they specialize getting people off the ventilator. So they came out, did an, like an assessment on me and said, we think we can get them off the vent. So that's how we made the decision to fly to um, Colorado. I was at rehab boot camp. Let me tell you, as soon as I got there, respiratory therapists, they come in, they turn your ventilator off for 30 seconds. So you have to learn how to breathe again. You're mm. like, uh, you're like, I don't know what to do. And then they're like, okay, you did good. We'll be back in a few hours. They do it three times a day, five days a week. Then they do a three, 30 minute increment. And then you also have like this education class to teach you about like you and your new body, so how to direct your care, how it's going to be for life when you get out of rehab. They're building you up. They're, they're empowering you to be able to go back out into the society. At any point during that moment, did you second guess yourself about wanting to move forward and still having that not now never wow and also at that point did they already tell you that you may not be able to walk oh yeah point? you have, definitely you have like doctors that are just going to tell you straight up and then you're going to have some that's got like a glimmer of hope and then you got other people that's been doing research so no you have you have information from a lot of different people the thing that in your head is that you could be temporarily or it could be long term. So you're kind of on a split decision because based on what you saw, like what you've seen in the movies, based on you know, the information you received, that's kind of like how your thoughts are too. So you always mm. have hope. Never give up hope, still today. Never mm. give up hope. But the other thing is live. Hope, live, and if it happens, it happens. So that's beautiful. Gary, that's that was really inspiring. And uh, right now you're in rehab and you're going through all this. You've, uh, you're off the ventilator and at some point you left and went home and now you have to leave back in society. Can you tell us a little bit more how you handled that and what are the discrimination, how you have to handle living with people that 
now you, you're almost like a stranger to them. Right. Well, when you leave rehab, it's basically like, what do we do now? Like, how am I going to work? How am I going to do, get care? How am I going to be independent? And so you have to basically go through all those processes first and utilizing your resources. Then once you have your resources and you're able to start hiring people to take care of you and to start to be able to have this independence to where you now can get out into the community, then you get to start to venture off and see how people treat you, you know, in public. Say you go to a restaurant, you go to order food. There's people at the table with you. Instead of the waitress looking at me and asking me what I want, they ask somebody else. Well, what would he like? You know, it's like, I'm right here. It's almost like you feel like you're invisible. 100%, I still do. There's a lot, oh yeah. So then say you go somewhere too, and same thing, situation, it's a restaurant. So instead of the waitress, maybe her asking someone else, she asks you like really slow, like you have a mental, like a cognitive disability. Mm. Like, what would you like? That's so cute. Would you like some France? Like, wait, hold on. Oh. Like, so, or you get the one, what would you like? They yell because they, they act like I'm deaf when really I'm, I have paralysis. L listening to you now, not only us, but also the audience can learn from this and know that just because someone has paralysis, that doesn't mean their minds are par paralyzed, their brains are still functional. They still feel, they still have emotions. They can still understand. It's not that they have mental or intellectual disability. And uh, that's really important that you voice that out. So we all uh, aware and on the same page. Uh, you talked about resources. What are the resources that are out there for the community and from government perspective? What are the things that they are doing to help people in need in this area? Well, some of the resources, when I got back, uh, there was a place called the Disability Network. And we met with Mr. Zelly and basically he was like, you know, you might not be able to believe this, but you're going to be able to achieve everything that you want to do. Just mm. uh, kind of be down. Just, just get informed, get get involved, basically. That's kind of like what advocacy was starting out. And basically what they set up was self-determination. So I started to, to be able to get um, an ad out and then try to hire my first caregivers and stuff while I was still at my mom and stepdad's house. So just getting support and that's paid through Medicaid and Medicare. But so that was one of the big resources. Now I'm able to have caregivers take care of me. Um, the other thing was going back to school. I was like, I might as well go to college, you know? <laughs> so there's a place called MRS, Michigan Rehab Services, where they help you either find work, own a business or go back to college. And what they'll do is they'll help cover the costs. That's, that's amazing. I wanted to ask, when you were talking about this, Yusuf Ambay just came into my mind. Is this gentleman, he's in um, Africa, he's from Gambia, and he was shot too. And he also is on a wheelchair. Um, and one of the things that I always think about with him is how can someone help him so that he could also go back to school and know that he also can achieve, just like what you were able to do. That school, is it, do they only deal with locals or is it international or? Uh, I went to an international conference of self-determination before, but it's on different levels. So yeah, it's through the, even through our country, it's not the same for every single state. And it should be universal, you know, that we're, we, everybody can have the best quality of life. I would say for that person, I would say to find out if those type of resources are in their area and then maybe connect, you know, someone or like the U S to, to him. And maybe there's a way to offer those services and provide jobs in that area. Maybe it starts a brand new thing, kind of like franchising. The, the, the program's already taken care of. It's done. All the work's done. All you got to do is implement it in that area and figure out where that funding's going to come from is the government going to fund these type of programs for people to be, you know, independent and the stuff that like how we're utilizing self-determination here. Um, I don't even know where to start, Eric, with everything that you've gone through and you're still striving. That's just excellent. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you was, I believe this happened in the 90s and we're in the 2000s and there's a lot of technology uh, changes that have happened over the over the years and I recall like when you just joined 
um, one of the things that I noticed was you were using your voice to instruct um, the applications or the software in terms of mm -hmm. what to do. So can you tell us more around uh, some of the technology innovations and how that has helped you in the quality of your life? It's a great question too. I also started working with Dragon, naturally speaking. That's the voice recognition software and that's what you heard earlier when I first logged on because I had to close all the windows and, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's how I type. I use Dragon. Dragon Action Speaking, I've been using it for what, 22 years? Now, um, that's how I get on the laptop, that's how I make phone calls, that's how I text message, that's how I do everything, I navigate. That's how I write, when people are chatting with me, I'm talking my words a minute, not typing my words a minute, I'm talking. Is that the voice recognition system? Yeah, it's called, it's, anybody can get, it's on the, it's just a program. It's a computer program by Nuance called Dragon Naturally Speaking. And when I first had it, like if a bird flew by the window, it would actually open up windows on my screen. You know, I'm like, oh. So, but it's, it's a lot better now. That's just one software or one program that utilized. Also in the early stages, assistive technology is what we're talking about right now. You would have like uh, these little plug-in boxes that you would plug like a lamp in or, you know, something and then you got, I had a straw unit, a straw that was hooked to like this machine. So I would puff on the straw and then the audio, a voice would give a command like, you know, living room, bedroom, and then you puff again to select where you want to go. So say I was in my bedroom and I wanted to turn the lamp on, puff, bedroom, then you puff again, TV, wow. remote, lamp, puff the lamp on, off, puff again, turn the yeah. lamp on and off. So this is the technology from the beginning. So are these softwares that anybody can go online um, and find, download, or do they have to pay yes. for it? Well, yeah, you got to pay for it. You got to pay for it, but it's more commercial now. So, Let's get more advanced now. Well, also the wheelchair. My wheelchair is run by Sip and Puff. So I drive it with the hard puff forward, hard sip backwards, soft puff right, and the soft sip left. That's how I drive my chair. So this is all this technology that's allowing me to be independent and improve my quality of life. Here we are in 2020 or, yeah, we are 2020. Then, uh, you know, all this smart technology started to come out. You know, the Google, the Amazon, mm -hmm. yeah, Alexa. And that's that's a game changer right there because mm -hmm. that's com that is voice recognition software. I have mine that's here, I actually got two of them. One in my bedroom, one in the living room. Um, I can make phone calls. I can listen to books on Audible. I can listen to podcasts. I can find out what the weather is. Tell us, uh, can you tell our viewers how the voice recognition system works? Well, if I want to know like what the temperature is right now, I can just go, Alexa, what's the temperature? Right now, 71. She said right now, it's 71 degrees Fahrenheit. It's, it's remarkable how we normally take those things for granted, right? But it's literally making life. your life a lot easier and, and to, to live through life in a, in a pleasant way, if I may say. Yeah, it's a game changer. That's what I'm saying. Like you just nailed it. People are like, yeah, this stuff is cool. I don't uh -huh. have to touch something. I can just say, hey, blah, blah, blah. But this is changing people's lives. Lives. And they're, and they're not marketing. That's what they're missing. Amazon should be all over this, marketing to people with disabilities. And making wow. the commercial say, look, not do something cool, it's a life changer. Amazing. Maybe after this show, we can get Amazon to give you a commercial for this. <laughs> it's all good. Let's do it. I'm ready for it. Let's do it, Amazon. Jeff, I'm Bezos, ready for you, listen. Bezos. That's right. <laughs> it will happen. So, speaking of uh, Amazon and Jeff Bezos, uh, they've done incredibly well for themselves, but you are also doing really, really amazing things in this life. And we really appreciate that you have managed, right? even with the disabilities that you face, you have used it to inspire you to actually open your own company. What are some of the achievements that are you are more excited about that you could share with us? But also I do want to hear about the company that you're running. Well, I would say probably the, one of the biggest achievements, and this is a life achievement decision, was giving forgiveness on who shot me. or Because wow. I don't know who shot me, but forgiveness was given and I was able to cut the cord to that anchor and let my ship sail. And I'd not allow that person to ever have any kind of effect on me. That's probably the biggest life achievement because without right. that, I think life would have, it, it would have taken a different direction. I think there could have been bitterness, resentment, and mm -hmm. 
it wouldn't have been this happiness. Uh, not the, I mean, there's still ups and downs and challenges, but it, they're still happy. You know, you're still happy because you get to wake up and do what you love. Was that like more like a journey or did that happen like outright? It happened in rehab. Actually, a chaplain came in, the goes and prays at the different rooms. And he just asked me, he was like, I wanted to ask you a question. Do you forgive who or whom did this to you? And I was able to speak with voice, but I spoke with my spirit. Mm. And, you know, it, it was heartfelt, you know, so it was truth. It wasn't fake and oh, no, I, yes, but no. No, it was truth and the world just opened up and the clouds opened up. Oh. It's like you did the right answer. Life's going to be good for you. You're still going to have challenges, but you're going to you're going to survive and you're going to I will provide what you need to be provided with. That's how it felt. Some of the other achievements I've, you know, I've testified through House and Senate, um, state and federal on long-term care or Medicaid and Medicare cuts. Anything to do with the quality of life of a person and not just a person with a disability, because when you start cutting on things, that, that, that's going backwards. We want to go forward. You know, we want independence. We want people to be healthy. The other one, I, um, I owned an internet radio station for a while and uh, the royalty rates were starting to like change. So we, a, a group of us went to Washington, D.C., and we introduced the Internet Radio Equality Act. And it got passed, and we were good for a while, but eventually there were some loopholes. And the other thing was, a big achievement was the Money Follows the Person Act. Uh, a guy named Dave and I, we got to speak to Congressman Dale Kildee, and basically he took that information about our lives and put it into a bill called Money Follows the Person. It passed, and it's still going on in... in wow. uh, you know, in legislation today. Then the other thing would be, you know, being able to move out of my mom and stepdad's house into an apartment and then into a house to rent. So the stages of the independence, let's call that independent achievement. Mm -hmm. And then being able to have my own care, you know, I hire my own caregivers. So my life became a business right after I got home. I'm the CEO of my life <laughs> of people taking care of me. That is a great achievement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. And then the, one of the bigger ones, the, you know, I, I'm a business owner. I'm an entrepreneur at soul and heart, but owning a business, you know, and that's the, I, I opened up a business November of 2011. So, yeah, I saw some of your items uh, online. Um, I saw, and also I saw your Instagram page. You have really cool shirts and stuff. Oh, thanks. I'm probably going to buy a few <laughs> and support. Yeah. Yes, yeah, music to my ears. <laughs> and then from there became the Inspire brand. When the Inspire brand came out, that like was like its seed of itself. And it grew into this big, beautiful tree that just keeps growing branches. Because mm -hmm. it organically grew its own branches for different meaning by the people that were purchasing it. We have a lot of people that are in Africa that are watching that have very, very limited uh, resources. Uh, so can you share with all of us, how you've been able to go through the adversaries and still be able to do all this on your own? Well, I think the key word is both of you, what you just said like two or three times. It's the how, because how is like a building block of mm -hmm. an answer to this goal. The how keeps going, how keeps building, and let's find the how, and let's have a nice, everybody share your answers, let's brainstorm. Let's have the whiteboard as they call it. Let's get out the ideas, let's find a way. Like we know the goal, if the goal there is a resource is care, that's the goal. How do we get to that goal? Everything that you could possibly think of, even from sponsors, something that's out of the box. You know, maybe the maybe they don't get wheel. Maybe there's people there that are able to afford wheelchairs. How can we do wheelchairs? Maybe the people will sponsor wheelchairs. Maybe they'll advertise on wheelchairs. Like, what is it that we can do? Maybe it's clean water. How do we get clean water? How do we, it's always the how could be, and that's the, what you have to figure out. And that's what yeah. I've had to figure out the whole time. Yeah. Because disability, when you're on that, you don't have like an insurance case or a workman's comp or an auto insurance or something like that you're oh, like, you're, you're on limited income. You know what I mean? Limited. So you have to figure it out. So how can I get that wheelchair? How can I get that lift? How can I get that wheelchair van? How can I get a house? Eric, wow, that's profound, and you're going to keep hearing that word from us. Saying, when you were saying the how, uh, it's almost like you could apply it to everything. Because as you were speaking from the beginning, 
where you went to, it's actually different from what I was thinking you were going to go, but it still made sense to wherever I wanted to take it, right? Even personal goals, personal things that you want to achieve, right? Yeah. It, it applied there. Everything that you said literally applied to that. Like the person that's watching, the young African that's watching, that wants to do something, but the resources are not there. If they apply exactly what you say, the how every day, figure it out, write it on the whiteboard, right? Not the community's agenda, but that personal, that person's personal agenda in what they want to achieve. Right. That's what I heard you say. Right, you can apply it, you can apply it to everything. I mean, just think about when you just go somewhere. If you want to go to like some store right now, how are you going to get there? I'm yeah. going to drive, I'm going to get on a horse, I'm going to walk, I'm going to use my wheelchair, I'm going to ride a public wow. transportation. I'm going to get on a plane or a train. I'm going to have someone else take me. I'm going to use a skateboard, a scooter, a, a, a Uber. It's the how. It's the how. How? We always use how. It's a lot of times when we say can is the fear, you know, on things. We just go, oh, I can't do that. Why can't you? Well, you know, or you don't want to. You know what I'm saying? A lot of things it could be like, oh, I don't, you know, you, don't, you just don't want to do it. When people say can't, it's over. It's over. Yeah. You killed your dream. You killed that goal. You already said uh, yourself. I, I definitely like that. Like, right? It's like if you start with how, then you're going to figure a way to, to get there. Right? But if you say, I can't get to the store, you probably Good will not. Catch yourself now from saying it. A lot of times, like if somebody says, can you move your arms or legs? I usually will say I'm unable to move my arms and legs instead of I can't. Because unable, that's, there's a possibility yeah. that that mm. can happen. Mm. But I'm not saying I can't. Mm -hmm. And I probably have said it because it's a, it's a habit. But right. I will try to correct it if I do say it. That's amazing. I try wow. not to have can't in my vocabulary unless I'm just saying it. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. I really, really love the way you ended that, uh, the how. So I just wanted to add something for people that are watching. Mm -hmm. We have to find how to get there, right? That will be the how. So get your why and use your how to get there. And I hope everyone that's listening will be able to use this uh, a few words to help them guide them through life, whatever your disability may be, whether it's intellectual, whether it's physical, whether you are just trying to become somebody in life or whether you're trying to achieve something in life. I think it's wonderful. It's very inspirational. And if one person can do it, we should all be able to do it. And I think you could just feel the energy here that we really truly appreciate the moment that you took to share your story it touches us and I'm sure it's going to touch a lot of the audience out there that are watching this. But speaking of ABLE, we should all be able to um, support your company by buying yeah. a few things from it. So go ahead and follow these uh, links below or at least the name of Eric's company to buy a few things and support his amazing uh, company. The website is called is InspireShirt.com. InspireShirt.com. Plus all the social handles are this inspired shirt, except Instagram, it's inspired shirt number one. So I think Eric is trying to be a little bit humble here. Um, can you tell us also about your podcast and all those major um, shows that you've done? Uh, yes, you're right. Being humble. Um, <laughs> I've been on a lot of different podcasts. One of the podcasts that I really enjoyed uh, this summer was Damon John's Power Talk. So that was really cool. I've known Damon since November of 2012. So he, we finally actually got to interview me. And it was awesome. It was on another podcast, that Super Joe Pardo, which he was, you know, that was one of my very first podcasts. Dr. Nandi, N N A D I, I think. And yeah, and I performed on it too. So that was pretty sweet. Uh, another thing, um, I wasn't on Shark Tank, but I was at Shark Tank. Damon John flew me out to Shark Tank and I got to see the whole set. The last thing, and since I just celebrated 23 years of life after injury, I was shot September 20th, 97. Wow. So I made a goal to be on 23, be interviewed on 23 different shows by wow. the end of the year. And the yeah. sister show made one of your shows. So we are absolutely, absolutely humbled yes. for that. If anybody wants to reach out to me, you know, like you were saying, there's people there's viewers in Africa that are on limited resources. Just reach out to me, like, and we can do like a Zoom thing. I'm not gonna do it for you, but we can. We, I can mentor you. 
Yeah. I have a wonderful um, friend. He calls me his wife. Um, <laughs> Yusufa. You are his he's, wife. He's divorced me. He's divorced <laughs> me 50 times already in one year and married wow. me again. Maybe that's what I should have used on the game. Who I've been divorced 50 times and been married again. But I will definitely connect him with you because, you know, every time I speak to him, we want to see how he can go back to school and have some kind of formal education and also be uh, independent because that's what he's been wanting for his whole life so that he could also help his uh, mom. That's what he keeps um, dreaming about. Um, let's make his dream a reality. I'll, we'll connect you guys together. Okay. We truly, truly appreciate your presence. Uh, we are on it. And we hope that also the audience and everyone that's watching will be inspired indeed by your story and your remarkable strength. So thank you so much. And we will see you very soon again. Bye, Eric.